year is 1955. I'm wearing a poodle skirt, and a woman on roller skates just served me a milkshake. I'm also a Russian spy, working around the clock to swing the opinion of the American people to the side of glorious communism. This is 1955, The War of Espionage, which is a card game for two players that we like to refer to as Twilight Struggle Light, or Diet Twilight Struggle. I like Diet Twilight Struggle. Yeah. It has a better ring to it. Yeah. So it's a uh, two-player card-driven game uh, depicting uh, spy activity during the beginning of the Cold War in the year 1955. I believe this game was a Kickstarter a couple mm. years ago. Um, so it's not exactly new, but I think you can still pick it up. Um, in your local game store or online. You'll be able to get it online if you can't find it there. It's pretty cheap. I think it's only like 25 bucks, maybe. Something like that, yeah. So how do you play? Well, each player is going to start by choosing a home country of the six available countries on the board. Some of the countries have a shorter and longer track, which means that they're going to be easier or harder to secure, meaning to move the cube to the very end. The object of the game is to secure three countries to your side of the board, which means moving their cube to the very end of their track on your side of the game board. The other way that you can win is by securing your opponent's home country, which is represented by a cube of their color. So each player starts with a hand of five cards, and then they'll play two of them on their turn. Unless it's the first turn, then you think you only play one. Um, and then cards can be played either for the action printed on the card, or they can be played for influence, which is represented by the number in the upper corner. And then you also have to pay attention to the flag that is on there. Yeah, so um, when you play a card for influence, it allows you to move the country that's depicted on the card is move that country's cube towards you a number of spaces equal to the influence. If your spy is located in the country that you're playing the card for, you get a plus one bonus to the influence in that country. You can also play the country card um, to move that country's cube regardless of if your spy is there, but you get no bonus. If your spy is in the country of the card you play, and it's a matching, uh, it matches another card in your hand with that same country flag, you can actually combine the two into one giant move, and that only counts as one card play, so you'd still get to play a second card afterwards. You can play a country card um, in your home country as well. Um, however, if the faction of the card you play to move your home country's cube does not match your faction, so if, for example, if you're the blue player and you play a red card to move your home country's cube, you get a minus one penalty to that... Um, uh, to that card's influence. And the same goes for the country that your spy is in. Uh, if you play a card that does not match the faction of the country that your spy is in, so if you are the blue player and you are um, trying to move that country's cube with a card that is, and the country is blue, and you play a red card, then you also get a minus one penalty. Right. Um, and then on top of all these cards with like different flags and colors, there's also mercenary cards, and those are considered wild cards, so... They count for whatever you'd like. Yeah, so they can be used to be combined with any card. If you're doing a combined influence play, you can also use them on their own or combine them together. Um, and they can also be used to block as well. And there is a blocking system in this game, which I think is probably the most, uh, of, for being a traditional or pseudo-traditional card-driven game, There, the blocking mechanism, I think, is what brings this game brings to the table to this kind of genre. Right, so there is an element of defense here. Um, it's not just about one player playing a a bunch of cards and then moving the blocks either way. Um, actually, if you have, say they're moving, trying to move the cube that's in Poland, if your spy is located in Poland, you can actually play cards to prevent them from doing that. Exactly. So when you defend, um, you can only defend in a country your spy is in or your home country. When you defend, you play cards from your own hand that has to equal or exceed uh, how much influence your opponent has played, and you can block their... Um, mo their cube movement, basically. Right. Um, so th this is kind of strategic because after uh, you are a player on their turn is done playing cards, they then draw back up to their hand size, um, which is the only time you draw, and then they are allowed to move their spy to any country on the board. Right. So I think what's important is moving your spy at the end of the turn. Um, that can play a really important role as how like the, the game plays out because you can't really do much. It it really is an interesting place to put it in yeah so like it what, it what it kind of does is you can um you can kind of bluff your opponent when you move your spy so when you move your spy let's say i move him you know from hungary to the u.s that tells my opponent that oh i'm gonna probably try and make a play on the u.s on my next turn because i get bonuses for having my spy there um but you can also use it to bluff too because you i can move my spy to a country to make it my opponent think i'm gonna play there 
and then they come over to get in position to block me um, preemptively, and then I play cards on a co the country they just left, because I'm allowed to do that if I have cards with that flag symbol on it. So right. it's a nice little cat and mouse game kind of going on, which is an interesting design. Yeah, which I think is why we liken it to Twilight, like Diet Twilight Struggle, because there is a lot of back and forth here. It's tug of war, kind of. For sure. So, um, so that, that's basically a complete turn. There's also um, certain cards in the deck that you can uh, play for their action, and they you, you tuck them under the side of the board, and they right. give you bonuses. They're called gadgets. Um, one of them allows you to increase your hand size uh, by one, so you mm -hmm. have six cards in your hand instead of five, and the other allows you to, um, and this is very useful, actually, um, you can discard a card from your hand and then move your spy to that country yeah. that's on the card for free as, like, a free move. So you could potentially do two moves in a turn. Right. Which is really useful. Also, having a bigger hand can be really useful too, um, since you're sometimes you want to like stack, stack flags that are on cards, and that can be hard to come by and even just the getting a hand of five cards. Um, there's some other interesting elements too. I mean, you know, there's some of the different card effects. You've got ones that allow you to draw more cards at the end of your turn, allow you to move your spy for free during your turn. They've got ones where you can move three different or two or three different countries, one cube. There, there are two or three different country cubes, one space towards you. There are you, some that are, um, that influence your opponent, so they either make them like discard everything except for two cards, or um, it makes them play with their hands face up, so you can see what flags they have on all of their cards. Which is cool and thematic for a spy kind of theme. Like game. I know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, there's also you can cancel your opponent's events and stuff like that. So it's it's actually really well thought out in terms of what the cards can do and how you can use the cards in different ways, which is really cool. Yeah, you definitely always have options for sure. Do you want to talk about what we like and don't like? Do we do the good news or the bad news first? Um, I always say start with bad news, and then it can only go up from there. I, I am of the same mind. Yeah. So what don't you like? Um, I, it's obtuse. I, we've played this game a lot. Um, I would say dozens of times even. And while I like playing it, there is a player aid that comes with the game. And thank God it comes with it, because I don't think I could just keep going back to the rule book but um without that player aid i'd be totally lost but i find that every single game we've ever played i've had to look at it and that's it's kind of annoying it's frustrating and specifically what you're referring to i think is the fact that um there's so much variability to what you get bonuses for and what you don't depending on the position of your spy or where you can block depending on the position of your spy it's like really hard to keep track of all the specific rules exceptions of like okay my spy is here that means i can do this card play this card play and i can block or my spy is not here means I can't do this, or I still can do this, but I get minus one to the influence. It's like really confusing. And right. I know, and you're not gonna hear it when you watch this video, but we have literally, just trying to describe the rules of the game, started like six or seven times over the sentences we were about to say because we couldn't get it straight in our head. Yeah. Like we're sitting here recording this with the player aid in front of us um, to make sure that we get the rules right, and it's still a challenge to remember each specific situation and how the rules work. Yeah. Um... And, the, and the rule book is not good. To, uh, it, it tells you what you need to know, but it doesn't stick. It's not like a lot of times I can remember rules because they seem like they make sense. This one, like, it doesn't stick in my head. And I'm usually really good at remembering things, but for whatever reason, I cannot remember all the different specifics that the rule book lays yeah. out. Yeah, like usually, I mean, there's some games we play where like the mechanics, the themes, and the rules, it all kind of like blends together and it makes sense. Like the rules make sense because, well, in this situation, like, of course. Um, there are certain situations where, like, the rules make sense, and I feel like in this game, it doesn't really. It's kind of like a lot of if-then statements, and it's just too much. And I think part of that is because the game is, it's an abstract game with a lot of theme. Right. Rather than a, a thematic game that's kind of abstract. I would say that this is most definitely an abstract game. Oh, yeah. it's. I would say it's more about the mechanics than the theme. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the board is really only there to keep track of the victory state, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, this is a card game with an abstract layer to it, uh, yeah. most certainly. And I think that's maybe why it's tough to get your, your head around the rules. Yeah. A little bit, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, I, I kind of like it a little bit, um, like, in chess, you, in order to, like, really play chess, you have to understand and know just by heart how each of the pieces moves and, and in which directions and, and ways and, like, and whatnot, and this game has a little bit of that going on to it. Like, you really yeah. need to, like, get the book, the rule book in your head like, yeah. by heart in order to play it. But I think what makes it frustrating is when you have a hand of cards, you may not necessarily remember all of your options, and then by judging by whatever happens on the next player's turn like you may use cards that you needed and i feel like i get lost halfway through 
a strategy that I'm trying to build. Um, maybe that's because I'm dumb or something, but <laughs> I just get a little bit, it's just a little bit frustrating. Thank God honest. neither of us are, are actual spies in the year 1955. We would blow. We yeah. would totally blow each other's cover, um, our own covers, everyone's cover. Anyway. Speaking of the cards, the um, in my opinion, the card uh, art is really hit and miss. I think some of the cards have a, I mean, they've got a cool style to them. It's kind of like this like 50s era, kind of like washed out kind of look illustration to it. But the actual art on the cards is like really up and down. Like there are some cards that are kind of cool. There's like a pigeon with like a tape recorder or something for <laughs> one of the gadgets. But, but then like there's this one that's like a dude sitting on a bench reading a newspaper and it literally looks like that like you know on the online that picture of like someone trying to correct that like famous painting like they try oh, to fix it you know right. and it just yeah, looks yeah, horrible yeah. it looks like that oh. um it's like really muddy some of the times the art is just like really muddy and ill-defined and so kind of goes back and uh, up and down depending on what card you're playing i think they were trying to make it look kind of like propaganda ish yeah um which if you're into that cool but it's not really it's not really memorable to me I, I also don't think they succeeded necessarily i think mm. some of the illustrations are pretty poor okay um that's fair. The, the other thing, and I don't usually remark on this much, but it just kind of bothers me here, is that, like, the graphic design of the cards is really noisy. Like, the way the cards are laid out um, is re just really busy on the eyes. You've got, like, a country flag in one corner, and then you've got the influence number, you've got the picture, the event text, but then you've also got all these, like, symbols all over the outside of the card that just relay the same information. Like, they're these little, like hash marks or like star symbols that mm. there's a number of them equal to the influence value of the card on one side of the card which is like the same information just twice with more design elements and like there's like a diagonal it the the format or the layout of the way text and art kind of come together um on the top half of the card is like really diagonal mm -hmm. but the bottom half of the card is like straight i don't know it just doesn't work for me like the mm. design and i mean it's not enough that i can't play it it's just i i wish i, I wanted cleaner? to well, I wish it was cleaner, and, and, and I want to mention it because it's something that I actually consciously thought about or think about when I'm playing is how noisy the card graphic design is. Yeah. Um, I'm typically, like, pretty lenient about all that stuff, but when I really notice it, I feel like I have to talk about it. Well, I think that combined with the obtuse rules that we've already discussed, like, makes it a little bit, like, ugh, like, what more information I have to process to make my next decision, so... Yeah. So... I mean, those are kind of like the things that I think frustrated us, but, um, actually, Onwards and upwards. I know. Great. We really like it though. Like we've played, we play it a lot actually. Um, as a game for two players, I think it's, I think it's great. I mean, it's, I really like the tug of war element. I like that, um, it, you know, one player can't like get out to like a crazy huge lead that there's variety in the card play. Um, I like that you get two card plays. I think that's cool. Yeah. Uh, it's not just one and one and one and one. It's like you play two, you can set up cool combos Right. Um, you, there's some there's some like effectiveness to combos you can set up that keeps your opponent kind of off balance. There is a bit of a meta game which mm -hmm. we always um, appreciate in games that you can kind of bluff people uh, or bluff the other player. Um, I like that it's two players. Um, it's perfect for our channel. Perfect for us. I really like how the board is two sided. Um, with oh yeah, shorter, I don't think that we've mentioned that shorter and longer tracks. So like, um, it's interesting because like you can play a longer game by playing one side of the board because the country tracks are longer, so you need more influence to get them to your side. Or you can play a shorter game. And I actually find that, um, having played both of them uh, a bunch, is that I actually prefer the longer side. I think I do too. Because um, there's more room for error, for one, because your opponent needs to get m more. But also I think it makes for a more dramatic end game because you can't just lock in one of the, the short countries on, on the outside yeah. of the board really quick and then yeah. like move your way in. Like With a longer board, like there's more of a give and take. There's more of like, uh-oh, you're getting one of those short short countries to the end and like I can't let you have that meanwhile I need to make sure that like my home country is defended so right um, but if you need like if you want just like a 20 minute game then the short side is there for you and you get the whole same experience which it's a subtle thing but I think it's really really well designed yeah and they could have easily just shipped the game with one option and they didn't yeah. so I definitely appreciate that too I also really like the fact and this is also something small but like at the very beginning of the game, you choose what your what your home country is, and that's really important because you can always play to your home country no matter where your spy is. And there's sort of this like strategic decision you have to make is, do I make my home country one of the shorter outside countries and make it easier for my opponent to snatch it from me, 
Um, but also easier for me to secure right off the bat. And defend. And defend a lot easier because yeah. it's shorter and you can play to your home country anytime. Or do I choose the longer one knowing that my opponent's going to have to invest a lot of work to get it to try and win that way. Meanwhile, I'm trying to get all the other neutral countries uh, to right. my side. So that, again, small design decision, but I think is like really cool. I've tried it actually with all three of the different countries. I've tried it medium, I've tried it on short, and tried it on long. And they, they all offer kind of their own benefits or yeah their own strategies their own path to victory depending on how you have to play the early game versus the late game which is cool Mm. um i guess the final thing i wanted to say was that um this is you know it borrows pretty heavily from classic card driven game mechanics stuff you know the the classic do i play the the card for ops or event in this case it's influence or action um but if you and you know my feeling on cdgs if you don't know my feeling on cdgs you should go watch our twilight struggle review because i had a lot to say about them but um, I love the card-driven mechanic of Ops or Event, and this game is really, like, it's a tight, small game that you can play in less than an hour that uses that mechanic as its primary game mechanic, um, and I think if you're, if you're curious about CDGs and someone has, like, like me, for example, has talked about them a lot, mm-hmm. and you're really unsure because, let's I'll be honest, most CDGs have historical themes or political themes, and, you know, that may not be up your alley, I would say that this game is a really good, like, get your feet wet kind of game for the CDG mechanics. Like, if you've ever, never played a CDG, this would be the game to start with to see if you just purely like the mechanic of Ops or Event. Yeah. Because it's a really easy game to play and learn once you get the rules down, as we've said. Um, and from there, you can then take the next step to something like Hannibal or Twilight Struggle or... 1989 or any of the other CDGs that are out there that are way more complex um, because if you can get this basic mechanic down you've done basically like 40 or 50 percent of the work of those other games yeah I, I mean I think that's like really well said um, I would I would absolutely agree um, especially for someone who is getting into CDGs um, for sure I kind of wish I'd started with this one um, but maybe I don't know maybe it was better that I went like head first into the uh the coin series. <laughs> I was gonna, so I was going to ask you that. So, like, obviously, this was not your first CDG that you played. Yeah. Um, do you feel like having played Twilight Struggle and some other card-driven games before this game, um, do you feel like you enjoyed it less or more because you're already familiar with the mechanic? I think more because I was already familiar with the mechanic. Um, I'm okay with killing my darlings, as it were. Like, some of those events are just really great, but you got to let them go. Um, so I really like that. Um, so do you want to maybe get to our review? Like, what do you, what do you want to give yeah, it? Yeah, final verdict. Um, um I, I think I'm going to give it, uh, I'll give it, oh, this is really hard because, because yeah. we have so much fun playing it and I don't know that we're getting that across in what we're saying because we did kind of go on and on about the obtuseness of the rules, but I really enjoy our sessions and it feels very like satisfying when you win. Um, but it's also really frustrating when you can't get something going. But I don't know. I just I at the end of the day, I really wish the rules were a little bit clearer Um, because I feel like after the 15th or 16th time we've played a game, we shouldn't have to keep referring to the player aid. So I got to give it 1.5 out of two spy fedora hats, I think. Because they're always wearing fedora hats. We're using the patented a couple of meeple uh, spy fedora hat scale in this review. I know. Um, I am. I can't decide. I, I'm right on the edge of a 1.5 as well. Yeah. But when I compare it to other games that I've given 1.5 and twos to, I feel like I have to give this a one out of two. Really? I feel like I do. I, it's not that I don't enjoy it. I really do enjoy it, and I really like playing it, and I love CDG mechanics. And it's not that it's bad. But I find that, like, if I'm going to play a CDG, I'm going to play something that I think is, like, up there. And it's not that this game isn't, but by comparison, it kind of isn't. You know what I mean? But it is, like, a snackable version. So, it like, is. are you knocking it's it? Not, I mean, I feel like you can't really compare put, it to, like, Twilight Let's Struggle. put it this way. It's not that I think it's a bad game. It's just that I. it's not on the top of my list to play... Um, in its family, and that's why I give it a one out of two. It's kind of a relative score. I think it's not it's that it's, of... it's not a quality judgment. It's a Justin's favorability judgment. Okay, so it's fair. I mean, we always say these are our favorite games, not necessarily like the best games, because everyone has their opinion. Um, I just I kind of feel like it's a little bit genre bending, and that it does have CDG elements, but it's a lot shorter and smaller, and so maybe it can't be as complicated as 
as the coin series. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like you can't really put it in that. But whatever. I mean, it's you. I gave it 1.5, man. I One think, and a half fedoras. I think this may be the first time that you've given more fedoras to anything than I have on this channel. Uh, we'll have to go back and check that. I'm pretty I'm sure. sure. Maybe, um, maybe Caverna, I think, what you might have given higher. I'm but. forever an optimist, so usually my scores are higher. Um, but I don't know. We'll have to see. Make it history. <laughs> In 1955. That's right. <laughs> uh, thanks for listening. Uh, yeah, and with that, we will uh, bid you goodbye.